At the westernmost limits of Britain sit two proud neighbours, shaped by the sea. Devon, a luscious county boasting two national parks. Proper people, proper county, proper cream tea. Yes. And hundreds of miles of dramatic coast. Grew up, lived up, loved up. Everything about Devon, I love. And across the River Tamar, Cornwall. Yeah! The ancient granite kingdom of Kurnow, thrusting out into the Atlantic. I have traveled the world, but I always come home. Where old ways enrich the new. Right, Bill, get up. It's a very special place, been here for 100 years. Millions of visitors head west each year. Some choose to stay for good. It's just so unbelievably varied. I love that feeling of freedom. This is my little bit of heaven in Devon. Whether born here or drawn here, there are still many deep-rooted folk. Always looking at the judge. Proudly holding on to their heritage and creating their own future. I love the ocean and to be part of something which is within our county's history. You have to keep working hard to stay here, but we're glad we're here. These are the stories of the people who call Devon and Cornwall home. Hidden away in the craggy folds of the South Cornish coastline, in its own concealed cove lies the tiny fishing village of Polpero. A perfect package of pitched roofs, ancient alleyways, and a sense of beauty that seems unaffected by time or tide. Huddled around its own improbable little harbor, Polpero looks boldly out across the English Channel between Foy and Plymouth. Polpero has a charmed history, but in amongst its tumbling streets, lifelong residents like Paul Butters are busily driving the village forwards with one eye on the future. We're now going to get into the narrow part now. Now uh, this is uh, the Warren, the beginning of the coastal path. Yeah. Polpero's streets evolved long before cars came along. And now Paul's contemporary alternative helps to haul supplies around the village. Thank you. Well, we need a four by four quad. You need the maneuverability and the smallness to be able to get around. Up there in that bungalow is where I was born. Born up there because mother couldn't get down the steps. Today, Paul's heading for a rendezvous at Polpero's beating heart, its picturesque harbour. He's meeting his old school friend and harbour master, Ollie Pucky, as they prepare their home village for a massive delivery. Ah, Paul, just a man. Do us a favour. Put some trestles over there. We uh, put them on the quad and get them over the other side of the store. This summer, Ollie's in charge of a new £2 million sea defence project which aims to future proof the village against freak storms and extreme tides. And he's going to need all the help he can get. God knows how we managed without him before, but he's an absolute star. The old harbour gate which protected Polpero from the sea's surges has been carted off and needs to be replaced. The brand new barrier will soon be arriving. And as the harbour master in charge, the burden is on Ollie. It's about the biggest thing the village has had, had done to it. I know we've had the gate there before, but no, this is really a super duper one. This is really made for purpose. The only one of its kind in the world. But getting it here will be a sizable operation. Those narrow streets mean that road transport was never an option. So the giant gate must arrive in the time-honored way, by boat. 
that storm gate doesn't just protect the harbour, it protects the bottom end of the village as well. People do come to see the harbour, so we need to protect it. When we have southerly or southeast storms in the winter, the place would just get devastated. Also on duty on the big day will be Chris, Ollie's 18-year-old son and his sidekick on the harbour. The new gate will protect his generation's future at Polpero too. So the most stressful time for me will be bringing the uh, barge in through this small gap in here because we've got a couple of big rocks that stick out either side. We've got to guide it in up through the middle and make sure it's... Um, it doesn't hit anything, basically. As the work to safeguard the harbour makes headway, the next few weeks will keep Chris, Ollie and the rest of the village wide awake and watchful. In the peaceful paradise of the North Cornwall countryside, Time ticks on at a gentler pace. Not far from the border with Devon and just a few miles inland from the coast is the parish of Warbstow. Standing strong at the heart of the parish, as it has for centuries, is the church of St. Werburgh. But time is taking its toll on the venerable building. And after centuries of holding its ground against the elements, this noble edifice is in need of its own local saints. Arthur Bradley and Alex Piper are experienced in restoring Cornwall's ancient buildings. And today, its medieval vestry window is in dire need of a mighty fix. We've got to take these two out. Um, that hopefully should be self supporting because obviously it's an arch. Until we get these out, we don't know if we're going to have to make a new one for it. Looking at it, they're looking pretty good, you know. So, and then come back and put it all back together again. As well as the church's ancient stone mullions, its leaded glass, which has bravely repelled wind and rain since the 1800s, is somewhat bowed and buckled too. The window isn't the same shape as the mullions at the top. It's way out, it's the wrong pattern, so we'll make it right when we put it back. As a team, the pair have over 40 years of combined craft and cunning. Grandad learned his trade in the 20s, and then he opened our quarry up in 1935. And so we've been going for 80, 80 something years now. So started it as soon as I left school, and yeah, if it's in the blood, I think. Right, that moved then. It did. Yes, I felt it. <laughs> With such an iconic building, Alex and Arthur want to keep as much of the original fabric intact as they can. Digging in there a bit. First, gingerly removing the splintering glasswork. I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's more on your finger there. Yeah. It's all moving at the top now, so, I mean, it's separating the glass from the stone, but it's, it's delicate, very delicate. With the glass gone, the heavy stonework is left pretty precarious. Yeah, I've got a new one there, it's knackered out, isn't it? Yeah. <sighs> well, the next stage now obviously, is take it back to the quarry, assess what needs doing to it, carve new pieces to put onto it and uh, get it all restored. St. Werberg's granite has been worn and weathered over many centuries. And Alex will now have to dig deep into Cornwall's geological treasure trove to find a perfect match. Later in Devon and Cornwall... Most important job of the day, this is. 
full steam ahead for trainee driver Will as he prepares for his big test. Whistle, Will. Everybody likes a whistle, don't they? We're not going to have that much room to play with. While the pressure mounts for Ollie as he prepares for Polpero's new harbour gate. I'm sure it will work perfectly. But they said that about the Titanic, and hey ho. In the heart of Cornwall, beneath the wide moor, sits its former capital, Bodmin. For centuries, its central location made it the perfect trading crossroads. And even today, Bodmin is still very well connected. It's the proud terminus of the Bodmin and Wentford Steam Railway one of the finest heritage railways in the country. Tickets, please. The line and the rolling stock are all gracefully aging, and so are the majority of its crew. Although a new kid on the block is bucking that trend, You like steam engines? Yes. Yeah, they're do. cool, aren't they? There you go, see? The next generation. Future of steam there. At 32, steam buff Will Marshall could be the future lifeblood of the line. Working here for the past four years, he's one of a new generation stepping up to the plate. And this summer wants to fulfill his dream to qualify as a driver. The Seven Valley Railway is where my dream started, and I, I can remember it to this day. I was at Bewdley Station, and a pannier tank came in, and I just remember my dad sort of saying, oh, is it possible for my boy to have a look? And he just picked me up, put me on the footplate. Right away. You're hooked from then, aren't you? Built in the 1880s, the line was a major driver of the Cornish Industrial Revolution transporting tin and copper and, later, china clay. But as the industry dwindled, so did the need for the railway. Saved from obsolescence in the 80s, it's now run by a devoted band of steam enthusiasts. But the route to becoming a driver today isn't easy. Will has had to serve his time in the railway's workshop, qualifying as the line's engineer. Yeah, they're a magnificent piece of, piece of engineering, and yeah, I love them. I, I feel really honoured that I can be here to, to keep it all alive for future generations. With a deep understanding of the engine's inner workings, he's confident he'll be equally up to speed taking the helm. It's exactly the same as driving a car, you know. They all act a little bit different, and there's things to know with certain situations. With his driving test just days away, Will is grabbing every opportunity for further lessons. And the first rule is keep your fireman and teacher well fed and in fine fettle. The most important job of the day, this is. Well, an old tradition, so I'm just warming my shovel up. Mark said it's about gas mark eight now, so we should be all right to cook on that. That is all right, mate. Proper job. <laughs> Thank you very much, Will. Fueled up and ready to go, Will and Mark take to the tracks. Take the handbrake off. Thank you, dear. They tend to go a bit easier then. Right away from the guard. Right away. Yeah, right on. Was I all right over the top? Yeah, fine. Absolutely fine. Give it a whistle, Will. Everybody likes a whistle, don't they? 
Stopping and starting these cast iron goliaths is a major challenge. And Will needs to be inch perfect as he practices both at Bodmin Parkway Station. Nice stop, driver. Thank you, Inspector. Here, the locomotive swaps ends of the train, ready for the return journey. But for Will, setting off again is proving a smidgen tricky. I might have to roll back a bit, mate. Is the steam brake completely off? Steam brake's on. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Got to leave it in the middle longer. No. Okay. Oh, right, yeah, I'm with you. Can I learn some of it again then? Are you happy? Aye. Well done, Will. Good start, mate. Practice makes perfect, and Will is on his way to achieving his dream. I've got faith in the training I've been given, and you know, I feel ready to, to become a driver. It's only natural to have a, have a have butterflies a little bit. This is a combination of my dream. So far, Will's on the right tracks. But with just days to go until his final test, he needs to make sure his learning continues full steam ahead. High on the slopes of a Cornish moorland, the raw rock which shaped the culture, language and law of the Cornish people. The mineral-rich granite of the mines and quarries. The same hard rock that laid the foundations for the farms and churches. Today, stonemason Alex Piper is busy at his family's quarry, working to repair the medieval mullions of St. Werberg's church window. That piece will go onto there, and then this piece will go back onto here then. Although some segments can be saved, key chunks of the window are beyond repair. And Alex must find and forge new blocks to blend in with the old. Big piece of stone for a little piece to come out of it, but uh, you've got to have it bigger to make the size. Using his grandfather's hammer in a tradition that links man and stone through history, Alex chips away. I've broke most of my fingers doing it over the years. There's one there you can see was broke. Your skin goes like leather, really, so you don't really feel it. Blow by blow, a small section of Cornwall's past is being shaped into a fragment of her future. I hope it all fits back together as it come out. Well, better than that, actually. <laughs> yeah, lovely, lovely. With his handiwork at the quarry complete, Alex's next step is to rejoin glazier Arthur Bradley and install the restored masonry at St. Werberg's Church. I've cleaned it all off, Alex. I've got all the cement out the, uh, out the, mullet, out the right, uh, yeah. sides and everything, so yeah. it's all ready to go. Scaffolds up outside and on the oh, inside. Ideal. lovely. Now comes the ticklish task of getting the refashioned vestry mullions and tracery to tessellate and tie together. Should be all right. We'll see. You never know with this job. It can go in easy, or it could be a pig. <laughs> Miracle for all lines up. It's um, carrying on an old tradition, really, I suppose, isn't we? Yeah, it's nice to know that the this, this skills are still being done, you know? Because who's going to do it if, when I'm gone? Once the stone stands proudly in place, the challenge now falls to Arthur. 
It's up to him to carefully rescue and restore the window's missing leaded glass. I think you're off the worst job of doing the glass. <laughs> you have plenty of st stressful evenings down there doing that, I reckon. I get a good, <laughs> p good pattern. Then. Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. In the South Cornish fishing village of Polpero, the big day is not far off. The new storm gate, which will protect its beautiful harbour from the worst of the winter weather, is almost ready. In the meantime, for lifelong residents like Paul Butters, who run around after the village's thousands of summer tourists, it's a case of just keeping things business as usual. Oh, tight, here we go. You know how to get there? Yeah. Put your sat-nav on. Put your sat-nav on. Put your sat-nav on. Right, hold tight. Hold tight. It's changeover day for many of the village's holiday lets. So Paul's rough and ready taxi service is in high demand. Nobody brought their bags down. They wouldn't get so many tourists. So it would take them at least four trips to and from the car park to get their gear down. With each round trip taking at least 15 minutes, Paul needs to pack efficiently. And plenty who come never want to leave. A lot of them see a, they see their dream. And if they can afford it, a lot of them sell up, come and buy one of these, and they are living their dream then. Down at the busy quayside, the squeeze is on for fellow Polpero native, Harbour Master Oli Pucky. He needs to protect his precious seafront for both tourists and residents. It's a different skipper on the barge now, and I'm not sure, no, if he's aware of our, our depth. Polpero's new two million pound lock gate is due to arrive at the weekend. And Oli needs to be sure everything is in place so it can be lowered into position successfully. We got the currents, we got narrowness here, rocks sticking out, can be a bit of a nightmare. So but I say I'm sure he's up to speed, and I know I am. So it go, it should go all okay. Fitting the lock gate will be a brave old battle of brains and brawn. A giant barge and crane will be floated into the harbour to fix the 50-ton gate into position. And the vulnerable village will be protected from storms once again. While Ole continues his forward planning... But not going to have that much room to play with. Regular summer work in the harbour has to go on regardless. And for his son, Chris, that means piloting a load of passengers on fishing trips out to sea. All right, guys, should take about 15, 20 minutes to get where we're going. We're going to go out uh, just inside the uh, bellboy. It's rewarding when you take a group of kind of six or eight people out and they don't have a clue what they're doing. They've never been fishing before. They've never met, might have never been on a boat before. Um, and you t get them out there. They find their sea legs, you teach them how to use the fishing rods, and they catch a few fish, come back in, they're really, really happy. It's just a good feeling. For Chris, the Cornish coast around Polpero is a bountiful playground. And it's not long before his anglers are hooked too. Did you go? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Green thing, look. Up comes a glistening mackerel. And the staple supplies of Cornish seafood are eagerly reeled in. Guys, I don't think it's going to get much better than that, so if you want to ride, wind your rods up and we'll make our way back to Paul Perry. I think the best view of Paul Paro is definitely from the sea. As you get further in, the village gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's the best view is definitely from out here. Back on dry land with his dad, 
It's time for Ollie and Chris's final preparation for the arrival of the lock gate. Give us have a the barrier out, yeah. and then that'll stop everybody going down. Here it is, a lovely evening. So the only access the public will ever be out with Warren, out Warren out here behind us, and then that'll be it. Right, I think. No. I think we're all ready now. The barge carrying the gate is due into Polpero at five in the morning, and they must get ready for what promises to be a momentous day. Big project, really well worked out. They've spent literally millions of pounds on this project. I'm sure it will work perfectly. But they said that about the Titanic, and hey ho. Later, in Devon and Cornwall... Well, South Devon is like God's country, isn't it? I mean, why wouldn't you want to be here? Farmer John swaps cows for goats in a fresh take on Devon's traditional dairy. A bit more about them than other domesticated livestock. The glass is my friend. I live with it. I can't be an enemy. It was something I live with. <laughs> While Arthur has a smashing time restoring St. Werburgh's medieval window. It's just a wonderful thing. I, I, I am just lucky to have this opportunity of working with this medium. The rolling hills of South Devon. Rich pasture and lush green grass. This is dairy country. But in this heartland of clotted cream and golden butter, farmer John Perkin is giving Devon's milky staples a contemporary twist. He's concocting a future with the gifts of his goats. Hello, girls. John farms on a small part of the 14th century Dartington estate, a fertile mix of arable land and woodland. I've been a farmer my whole life. My family have been farmers for, for generations, so it's kind of in the blood. I've tried a few other things, but keep coming back to farming. South Devon is like God's country, isn't it? I mean, why wouldn't you want to be here? Together with his wife, Lynn, John took over Old Parsonage Farm in 2015. And although he does keep a few cows, his passion is for their dairy rivals, goats. I particularly love the goats. I think the goats is um, definitely my favourite. They're, they're unique, they're full of character. They've got their own individual personalities, so yeah. they're quite sweet. A bit more about them than other domesticated livestock. This is Cara, she's my favourite. She's special, yeah, she's, she's so placid and so friendly. She's, uh, she's an absolute angel. <laughs> John and Lynn's 350 goats amount to quite a tribe. And to make sure they yield the finest milk, they live in the lap of luxury. Well, we've got three different breeds of goat on the farm. We've got about 160 milking nannies. Most of them are based on the Anglo-Nubians. You see these Anglo-Nubians with the long, floppy ears. We've also got Toggenbergs and Sarnans, which is sort of the, uh, mixed in amongst the breeds. This is a little Sarnan kid, and uh, these are all first-time mums as well. Like most cows, John's goats are milked twice a day. Come on, girls. They don't produce as much in volume as Devon's famous creamy cows, but they make up for that in other ways. They're distinctly cleaner and uh, a lot easier to milk than cows, to be totally honest with you. They're very expressive, they're very curious. These girls are in your face the whole time. What's not to love about that? We sell about half the milk to a local cheesemaker and process the rest of the milk ourselves. Many traditional dairy farms in Devon are struggling. By diversifying, John set out on a different but just as palatable course. 
we do four different products. We do the straight goat's milk, uh, kefir in three or four different flavors, yogurt, natural Greek style yogurt, and we do the ice cream. So it's ice cream day today. This is about us making our own product from our own goat's milk. It's all local, uh, and, and that's the sort of combination of what we're really about. Right, and George, let's give it a go. I suppose this is the best part of the day where you've done the batch and, uh, of course, it's all got to be sampled. Oh, that's a good one. Amazing. Well done, fella. With a fresh batch of goat's milk ice cream on board, John heads off to set up stall at Widdicombe Fair, a traditional country show that attracts visitors from far and wide. It's the perfect place to get a taste for Devon's delicious products. Two scoops. Enjoy. Have a good show. Especially with the goat milk ice cream. You get two scoops so you can mix up the flavours if you want. There you go. Lovely. That looks delicious. Good. Enjoy. That's the last scoop of vanilla, I'm afraid. Right. Uh, chocolate and salted caramel is all we've got left. It's been good. The sun's really come out. We've sold well. I wish I brought more now. Never mind. Sorry, folks, we're just sold out. Could have kept going for another two hours if we brought more ice cream with us. So I'll just have to go to the beer tent instead. We're really lucky, and we have to sort of pinch ourselves every day to say we are living in a fantastic part of the world. At Warpstow in North Cornwall, the parish church is being painstakingly restored. Centuries of wind and weather have battered and bruised the medieval vestry window. Now, a few miles away in his glazier studio, 78-year-old craftsman Arthur Bradley is faithfully repairing its historic leaded glass. It's our heritage. The mason and the stained glass man from the past have handed me the baton, and it's my job to carry that baton until I've got to hand it over to somebody else. The main thing is to protect and not let it disappear. It's a craft that calls for a skilled hand and a patient heart. You've not got to be afraid of the glass. And you've got to listen. The glass is my friend. It's, uh, I live with it. I can't be an enemy with something I live with. <laughs> I am just lucky, so very, very lucky to have this opportunity of working with this medium. I love it. Fabulous. Yeah, I'm pleased with that. It's gone as planned. Over the next weeks, the gaping holes in St. Werberg's vestry window are filled one by one. And today, Alex and Arthur are back at Warpstow to put the final glass panel back in place. All the profiles are different on every window because of the age of it. It's not machine made, it, it, it's hand carved is this and uh, all this profile so everyone is slightly different. This is the most difficult bit. Right, it's gone in. So that's done. It's solid. Very pleased. Once Arthur has secured his glass with traditional lime mortar, the protective paper sheeting is peeled off. Looks good, Alex. Not too bad, not too bad at no. all. Yeah, no. glass is looking nice and clean, you know. Yeah, <laughs> cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. Thanks ever so much. It's all right, you no take problem. Care. Yeah. yeah, on to the next one. On to the next one. <laughs> That's the dream team, oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Old and young. <laughs> <laughs> Job done, and churchwarden Helen 
is the first to sing their praises. Oh, gosh, that looks fantastic, chaps. Oh, oh thank you. Amazing. Oh, thank you I'm so you like much, because the church will be so grateful for all that lovely work you've done. So thank you. Fantastic. All right, thank you. It looks really, really good. Safe and strong. Yes, wonderful. Filled with light anew, the crafts that have preserved St. Werberg's for a thousand years have once more secured its future. Well, this is a, a tiny little village church. It's not a cathedral where millions of people will see it, but it's still as important and it's still a piece of our history. And it's, it's bringing it back to life again. Later, in Devon and Cornwall... Yeah, it's a big unit, the whole lot, you know, for a small little harbour like ours. That's, you don't need anything bigger than that coming in. Polpero's huge new harbour gate arrives in style. It's not like working on dry land. Here you've got the elements of wind, waves, human factors as well. Everybody knows it's my test date today, so, yeah, there's, there's been plenty of support. And a ticklish time for Will as he takes his final test to become a train driver. So just got to go past the points here, not it in the buffers, because then I would fail my driving test. At the Bodmin and Wentford Steam Railway, it's a big day for trainee driver Will. Morning, Mr. Spink. With the shortage of young drivers, he can help secure the line's long-term survival. And today, he's about to take his final driver's exam. How are you feeling, man? Well, about your big day. A bit nervous. <laughs> You'll be OK. Thank you, Mark. I'm very excited. I've got butterflies, you know. I think that's only natural. There's this excitement and a bit of adrenaline, I think. I feel ready for it. Assessing Will is instructor Mark, who's also the old pro that trained him up on the engines. You know, Mark's been really good. He's had chats with me and, you know, they, he's one of the, the guys who's been instrumental in bringing me on. Yeah, I just having to pinch myself a bit, really. It's, um, it's just an awesome dream. Final checks completed. It's time for Will to take control and run the show. Right away. Steam engines are powerful and hugely complex pieces of machinery. Clear the platform. Thank you very much. Despite the chunky levers and hissing valves, today's wet conditions demand a sharp eye and a subtle hand. You. For Will, each manoeuvre now is vital. A carefully calibrated calculation of steam, steel and speed. It's all just training that I've been given, trying to have a really suent trip, so you don't want, like, really harsh braking or anything like that, Where because everything I do here is amplified in the coaches, so I want to make sure that the public have a really nice ride. The train pulls in to Bodmin Parkway, where Will and Mark need to turn the train round for the return journey. So I've just got to go past the points here, not hitting the buffers, because then I would fail my driving test. I'll just change the points then, and then we can run round the train. Bodmin Parkway is a station where old and new slide side by side as heritage steam and high-speed modernity pay homage to each other. It's brilliant for, for sort of seeing old and new. It's lovely sometimes. You'll get a train from Paddington to Penzance, which is there now. You always get, like, waves and people looking. There's people now in the coaches looking at us. You happy there, boss? Yeah, I was born happy, mate. <laughs> <laughs> As the train sets off, Will now takes on the most challenging stretch of the track. That's a 
that's a really tight curve there and starting to get very steep. So you want to make sure you got the momentum. That was good, Will. Well done, mate. Thank you. Very slippery there. He's soon on the home straight. Light a bit here. Spot on, Bill. Lovely stop, Thank mate. You. Oh, that was awesome. But has Will done enough to fulfil his dream of becoming a steam engine driver? Unfortunately, I've got some really bad news. And that is that you're no longer a fireman. So congratulations, driver Thank you very Marshall. Much. Thank you. And very there's much, a little yeah. certificate there to go with it. Oh, beauty. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark. All right. Dreams come true. Mine has, anyway. <laughs> Early morning at Polpero in South Cornwall. Just offshore, the blinking lights of a huge incoming barge signal the harbour's new lock gate is on its way. It's the moment the whole village has been holding its breath for. Now the strain is on harbour master Ollie Pucky and his son Chris to make sure this vital installation goes to plan. Have fun. Just heading out now. No problem from the harbour, going to pick the, uh, the barge up. So I just go in, advise him about different rocks sticking out on either side of the harbour. But I'm there more for advisory than anything. Today, timing is everything. They have no more than a narrow window to work within, determined by the tidal timetable. And even before his rendezvous with the barge captain, Ollie's already under pressure. I reckon for the time we get going, it's going to be another three quarters of an hour yet before we're at the entrance. It's rush, rush, rush before we get going, but that's one thing we're going to be doing on the barge. Hi, guys. Good morning. With a barge this big and shifting seas, there's little margin for error. The solid harbour walls suddenly seem flimsy and vulnerable. So this is it, guys. This is what the last three months and £2 million has been all about. That's basically the next two hours, so fingers crossed, and here we go. For the people of Polpero, this is a once-in-a-lifetime spectacle. The new harbour gate is designed to protect their boats, homes and livelihoods. It's not like working on dry land. Here you've got the elements of wind, waves, human factors as well. While Ollie and the onboard team slowly swing the monster gate into position, Chris helps brief the divers. They're the ones that are checking to make sure that the gate fits on, so any needs that they have, I'm just here to kind of run around for them, basically, and provide the boat. And then there's different people dotted around the harbour in case anything goes wrong. The gate needs to be lowered onto two metal hinge brackets, one underwater. It's a job that demands pinpoint accuracy. This is the nerve wracking bit, it's just the final line up for it drops in. When you're dropping the gate down, the water will move the gate off of the hinges, and I've got full faith that they'll be able to do it. With the teams both above and below water happy that everything's in position, it's job done and smiles all round. And now it's gone in and they haven't got to go back out again, it's a big relief. It's been a lengthy, tense operation. But for Ollie, a huge relief now that his new harbour gate is safely secured. Ooh, time for a cup of tea. 
yeah, it was a bit nip and tuck coming in. As you see, you know, there's not much room either side when you've got some of that size. Yeah, apart from that, it all went smooth. Heart rate only went up half a beat, so... <laughs> Over the years, the tides, the lock gates, and the harbour masters of Polpero will always come and go. But for Ollie, the village's unique charm will never change. So before, it's a joy to work here, a privilege, really. There's nowhere better in the world. Absolutely stunning. And we're so, you know, lucky that it's not changed since I was a boy, really. These are the stories of people and of place. We are lucky enough to be here all the time. <laughs> Where lives are lived out as they've always been. As long as we can keep farming, we'll keep farming. At sea. How stunning is this, eh? In field and fold. These are our future, our next generation. And beyond. This is our economy, we keep it going. This is not to be lost. Where heritage and tradition are held dear. I guess you take it in stride to a certain extent. Hand in hand together with fresh energy and new approaches. Come back to me, Bert. And efforts to protect. <laughs> We've got it all. How can it be better than Cornwall? There's so many beautiful spots. You need two lifetimes to see them all. These are the stories of Devon and of Cornwall.